This nation was founded on the principle that all men are created equal. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men. That all men are, are created, created equal. I'll tell you what freedom is to me. No fear. I mean, really, no fear. It's a death. From WDET in Detroit, this is Created Equal. I'm Stephen Henderson, and I'm here with our weekly recap. I've got Carrie Jr. the second, our producer in the studio with me. Hey, hey, how you doing? No, no weekly recap music. This no, week. yeah, you know, I'm still trying working to... on that. <laughs> That's fair. We're still not working ready. on it. It's not ready yet. Uh, we'll see. It'll be like a long, drawn out process. I feel like at this point, we'll kind of keep teasing it until we. Come up with something. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this week, Carrie, we had a really substantive week of conversations. Yeah. Really heavy, serious subjects uh, all week long, in fact. Uh, we talked about uh, a, a wide range of things as well. Some on the edge of the news and some more thoughtful, more mm-hmm. pensive about mm-hmm. uh, equality and inequality. We had a conversation about two Pulitzer Prize winning biographies of Dr. King that were written more than 30 years apart. Uh, We also talked about whether there was space for Arab American voters within the Democratic Party, given the tension with Israel interest over the war in Gaza. And we also spoke about a forthcoming minimum wage increase and paid leave for many different workers Mm -hmm. in Michigan. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to start with the discussion about the minimum wage increase. That was a a news item from a couple of of weeks ago. And this is a huge subject here in Michigan, uh, this idea of making the minimum wage higher for lots of different workers, including workers who uh, are tipped workers, as we call them. They work in restaurants and their wages set lower because they supposedly make up for it by getting tips. This new rule would raise them to the same minimum wage as everyone else. And then it would institute paid leave for a wide range of workers in Michigan, something that we have also been talking about for a long time but haven't gotten to. And we're behind several other states. Mm-hmm. I think there are 15 states already that are that are doing that. So we talked with Danielle Atkinson, who's the founding and national director of Mothering Justice. This is a nonprofit that has been advocating for policies like these for a really long time. And then uh, we paired her with Brian Kelly, who was the former lieutenant governor of Michigan under Governor Rick Snyder and is now the CEO of the Small Business Association of Michigan. These two don't agree, Uh, and so we had a really lively back and forth uh, about these changes to compensation and leave uh, for workers in Michigan. If businesses would just pay living wages across the board, we wouldn't have these kind of regulations. We wouldn't have advocates pushing for government to, to, to try to mandate these things, and the flexibility that you were talking about that's so important for for businesses would, would still be available. They could figure out ways to, to work with their employees, to work within their business models, but to make sure – that, you know, as Danielle points out, that somebody doesn't work a whole shift in a, in a restaurant and go home with no, with no tips. I mean, I, even if it's just a handful of people having that experience, it's not acceptable, I think, uh, from, a, from a societal standpoint. So I wonder what you can say about how businesses think about the people who work for them and the obligation to make sure that – they, they, they're making living wages. There, it, there is a, a current minimum wage. And if you increased uh, the minimum wage, regardless of what, what you set that minimum wage at, for the tipped workers in particular, the law requires that they never can make less than that. Mm-hmm. And any employer that is breaking the law, they should then the Department of Labor should come down on, on that employer and um, take uh, aggressive, corrective action. But that that floor exists in the system today. What I'm afraid of in this is that it puts a ceiling on it. That uh, the idea that uh, that people are just going to continue to uh, to go out at the same rates that they do, given higher prices when they've already been hit hit every which way um, by higher costs of, of everything, 
um, and that they'll continue to tip as much. And uh, and the other thing too is, I mean, it's one of the thing, areas where customers are complaining a lot. There's tip fatigue right now that is happening. So there's while it is true that like tipping has popped up everywhere, it seems like across you know daily life and places that you, places that you haven't seen it before. There's a lot of fatigue because people are seeing that I'm already paying, you know, you've already raised prices in a bunch of different ways. And then when the, when the small business owner themselves, like they're the last ones to get paid, you know, they're the, they're the one, like everybody else has to get paid first. And, uh, and, and it's not unusual for them to go without any pay at all from the business, especially in, you know, restaurants are just a really tough business. Mm-hmm. It's a, the margins are are razor thin. A very small uh, differential can um, can make a huge, huge difference in um, in just their sustainability in uh, in moving forward. So I I think that this this idea that the tipped wage has to go away is one that it has a it has a bigger impact of putting a ceiling on what workers can uh, can make as opposed to a floor. Which if if people don't think that the floor Today, if the minimum wage is right, then you can have a discussion on what the what you think the the floor ought to be in terms of the new minimum wage. But um, but I don't I don't understand this idea of putting a ceiling on it, and and I and I think ultimately that's what what is happening here. And, and I didn't um, I, I wanted to cr- uh, correct something that w- was said. I never said that all restaurant workers um, hated the idea of going away from the from the uh, tipped wage system. Like said, many of them do. 70%. Yeah. 70% yeah. in the last survey yeah. liked the system how it is. They like tips and having that upside because they know that even though it doesn't come in evenly, if you know, work on one of the one of the nights where it's where it's busy, they know that they're going to get like what amounts to a shift premium on that. There's an incentive to work a Friday night. And um, and and they'll they'll have some people that tip nothing, and they'll have some that tip modestly, and then they'll have a handful of people that will tip a lot, and then it all averages out to a lot. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's it's lumpy, but they have this bigger earning potential, and um, just that going to a system where you might have a, a different level of um, of guarantee because the minimum wage itself is going up. But it's still something that I think a lot of workers are fearful so, will be a ceiling more than a floor. So in some ways, Brian, it, it, it's it's as though you and Danielle are talking about opposite ends of the economic picture here. I mean, you, you're talking about the potential at the top for people who who benefit from the current system and can maximize uh, their their place in it. That you're you're worried about that being curtailed somehow by by these regulations. Meanwhile, you know, Danielle's talking about people who are left behind and left out in some in some cases by the current system and who need that that intervention to make sure that they even have the opportunity uh, f- for those things. But Stephen, they have to be paid minimum wage. Right. And what I'm saying is that if anybody but, but not but, we know that they're but, not I in mean, some cases. But I, I mean, and I'm sure that in every single law, you can find somebody that didn't follow the law, and the law should come down hard on those people. But the idea that you have, because you might have an outlier, somebody who didn't follow the law, or for some reason the government that didn't uh, enforce the law when it was pointed out that it wasn't being uh, followed, the the idea that you have to take away potential from another worker in order to better impose the the, the floor that already exists. That, that's what I'm saying is that, that the restaurant workers may not, under Michigan law, they may not make any less than minimum wage. Right. If you want to make minimum wage higher, then that's a different debate. Make minimum wage higher than the tipped wage credit has to be made up at a higher level. But there's a um, but th- but that's the law. You cannot make less than minimum wage today. Right. And if somebody breaks that law, they need to be uh, punished for it. But Brian, it's also true that you are not supposed to your gender or your race is not supposed to determine your pay. It's not supposed to determine whether your pay is equal to people who are doing equal work. And yet we know that. When you look at the wages that people of color and and women make, they often are different. I mean, some of this is about 
the way in which business operates anyway, regardless of what the law says, and trying to counteract it. And I agree with you that, look, people who violate the law need to be held accountable. But but what would you do other than this kind of approach to correct what's what's going wrong? I think what ends up happening with this solution is that there are fewer jobs and less income by the by the workers. I mean, I think that is ultimately the um, the outcome when you when this all plays through is that you'll have fewer that people will make the workers will make less mm. and there will be fewer jobs available for them. Mm. Daniel, how do you, well, we how know do you that, respond yeah, to that? Yeah, that's not that's not true. We we know the facts are that less the states that have phased out the tipped credit um, have less instances of poverty. And as you mentioned, and as I mentioned before, um, there is an inequality based on your race and your race and gender uh, amongst the people that are earning. Uh, tipped wages. And then they are, if you are someone who makes tip wages, you are two times more likely to live in poverty. So those are the facts. And we know, unfortunately, that just because a law is designed uh, to work a certain way, that it doesn't always work that certain, that work that way. That's why we have a full-time legislature. That's why we have such a popular election cycle. Um, and, you know, if if laws worked the way they were originally intended, I would uh, be on a beach full time. <laughs> this is my job because the laws have to keep up with the sea change of opinion, how people live, how businesses operate, um, and the current reality. And the current reality is that depending on who you are, where you work, you will get paid differently for doing the same job. And that's a system that doesn't benefit any of us. Mm. So, so I, my last question to each of you is is about the, the I guess, the belief you have in the, the probable outcome here. Uh, Danielle, are, do you worry that this will cost jobs, that this the, the, this ruling and and the changes to paid leave and and tip wages will result in in businesses just deciding that they can't employ as many people as as they did and if they if they do that does that mean this is a failure does that somehow compromise the overall victory that 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 you realize from a policy perspective here yeah, I am hopeful based on the evidence of states that have enacted one fair wage, have phased out the tip credit and who have enacted paid sick days, that this is going to be tremendous victory for all involved, not only the individuals that will be directly impacted with higher wages and the ability to care for themselves and a loved one when they're sick, but also the favorability of Michigan as a state where people want to live and stay and thrive. You know, I have I have six children and I want them to stay here. I want them to look at the benefits that Michigan provides and say, this is a place that I want to be my home forever. Mm. And we can't do that unless we're competitive. So I am really, really hopeful that this will will continue the tradition that we have in Michigan of being a worker friendly uh, state. I also am hopeful uh, and and I plead <laughs> with the organizations that represent constituencies that might be concerned about this to prepare them for the changes, right? These are phased in changes. And I believe that at uh, the past 10 years old, um, again, like I said, six years of legislation, eight years in front of voters as a question and 10 years as legislation mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the legislature. And, as, and, uh, and instead of taking that time and preparing businesses for the sea change in public opinion and need, uh, we've been fighting over, over can we undermine the will of the people? Mm -hmm. And so I employ, implore them to take this time and to equip their constituents with the resources that they need uh, to be able to make this transition smoothly um, and and with as little hiccuping as possible. Yeah. So, so Brian, I guess my question to you is the, the converse of, of that. When you look at the history of wage increases, minimum wage increases in particular, yes, there's usually a, a, a short-term 
sort of slide back in in you know uh, performance business performance and 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 sometimes there's a retraction of jobs but of course over time uh, the economy grows because people have more money people are able to afford more because they're being they're being paid more uh, I, I'm going to go back to to Henry Ford saying that uh, look I'm going to pay people five dollars a day when that was a lot of money because I need my employees to be able to be the customers. Uh, why shouldn't we believe that that theory sh- will, will hold here, that, that paid leave and increased uh, tip wages will expand the economy and make things better for everyone overall? I think there are three outcomes that are fairly predictable. And yes, of course, we will do everything that we can do to help our members prepare for compliance with new uh, regulations, no matter what they are. The fact that we may disagree with them or concerned with them do not mean that we will not do everything we can to help them prepare to uh, to be compliant. The uh, But I think the three very predictable things that will happen is that first, uh, many workers, because it's loss of flexibility in a one-size-fits-all system, that some, and I dare say many workers will experience changes that they do not feel are pro worker, that are not good for them, that, that they're not going to be happy with uh, in terms of how, uh, how it unfolds compared to what they currently get. Um, I think that consumers will experience higher prices, and consumers have already been battered by, uh, by inflation over the course of the last several years. And um, and and that's that's a real real concern, and what are consumers going to do in the face of of high prices? And then small business owners, I think, are going to be in a really difficult position where they're going to be able to they can afford they'll be able to afford fewer jobs uh, to offer, and unfortunately, some are going to go out of business. And it's not because they're bad business people; it's because they're operating in, in small enterprises with very very thin margins, and uh, and changes have a huge impact. On them, so I think those three things together mean that uh, you'll have an overall uh, negative impact on workers, consumers, and small businesses, uh, even with the best of intentions. That was our conversation with Danielle Atkinson of Mothering Justice and Brian Kelly of the Small Business Association of Michigan about increases to the minimum wage and mandatory paid sick leave. That episode aired Monday, August 12th. Coming up next, we are going to listen back to a discussion with authors of two Pulitzer Prize winning biographies of Martin Luther King Jr. These two books were written nearly 40 years apart. We'll be right back with more Created Equal. Welcome back to Created Equal. I'm Stephen Henderson, and I'm in the studio with our producer, Carrie Jr. II, for our weekly recap show. Uh, Next, Carrie, we've got this really exciting conversation about Martin Luther King Jr. And we have this conversation with two biographers of King, Jonathan Eig, who wrote a biography in 2023 about Martin Luther King and won the Pulitzer Prize this year for it. And we paired him with David Garrow, who wrote a biography of Martin Luther King in 1986, so more than 30 years earlier, uh, and he won the Pulitzer in 1987. Uh, we uh, We had a really lively conversation with them about the difference when you're writing a biography uh, just a few years, really, after someone is dead and when you're writing it decades after someone is gone, uh, what what is the difference in the lens that you mm-hmm. get to bring to it? Yeah, the lens, like people's, the, our idea of them shift and change over time. And so how does that influence the way that they wrote or approach each of their biographies? I mean, I thought it was really interesting because it both brought pretty good perspectives from their work into the conversation about King and about our perception of King. Mm -hmm. And I think in this segment here particularly, you all get into some really interesting conversations about Dorothy Cotton and her work in the civil rights movement and her proximity to King. Um, And you also really have, they they get some really good uh, 
points about how we view King and his legacy, right? And how that may be, um, may not be in alignment with his original mission. So, mm-hmm. pretty yeah. good. It was, a, it was a really, really lively uh, back and forth. So I want to start this segment with Dorothy Cotton, um, and and I want to talk about the difference in sort of the understanding of her and her relationship to King between the two books, uh, but also uh, I, I don't want to I don't want to uh, overemphasize that to the exclusion of the importance of her role to the movement, and to the work. I think when you think of King, uh, you have to think of Dorothy Cotton, uh, among lo- lots of others, but but in a very primary way, powering um, powering the movement. Jonathan, I'll, I'll, I'll have you start because, uh, because you are able to write differently about her in 2024 than uh, someone would have been in the 1980s. That's right. on, on the most personal level, uh, we can now acknowledge the fact that Dorothy Cotton was a hugely important person in King's life, that often when he came home from his travels, he would go to see her before he went home to see his wife and kids. And there were people in the movement who knew and thought of her as being almost um, a second wife mm-hmm. in many ways, that she provided just a huge level of comfort and understanding and, and affection for King, uh, who was under, of course, enormous pressure all of his life. And in the, in the larger context, it's worth remembering that she and so many others, uh, women were vital to this movement. And King had a blind side. He didn't see their abilities as leaders necessarily. Mm -hmm. He didn't Mm -hmm. recognize their potential as leaders. Ella Baker, um, uh, among others, you know, had a lot to offer as executives, as administrators, as as organizers, and and King sometimes um, failed to appreciate their potential. Um, But nevertheless, it was the women in the movement from Dorothy Cotton to um, Ella Baker to you know so many others, uh, Joanne Robinson, as David referenced before, who made this movement go, and that there uh, there would have been no Martin Luther King uh, without their work. Yeah, uh, the, the personal relationship between the two of them. Uh, uh, talk about how much more we understand about that today than we would have thirty years ago, and and why? What is it that makes that possible? Well, for the most part, it's that she wanted to be private about her personal mm-hmm. relationship with King, mm-hmm. and um, as long as she was living and um, and 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 preferred to be um, private, we um, scholars in the field and David uh, can speak to this protected her privacy, and um, she told friends about her relationship with King, and of course, everybody in the movement knew about it, but mm-hmm. she did not want it to be public. She did not want uh, to be known as simply as she was, she was worried. I think that she'd be known simply as his, as his great love, as one of yeah. his loves, but not as the great activist that she, that she was. So it, it, um, it, only- exactly. If, if I may chime in, yeah, go um, ahead. I mean, Dorothy was an immensely warm, effervescent person. Um, but she nonetheless made it very clear that she did not want to be pigeonholed. And so neither in Bearing the Cross nor in, in my earlier book from 1981 on, on the FBI's pursuit of King, mm-hmm. did I explicitly identify Dorothy's uh, full role in King's life, though it's it's there uh, in, in ways that... that most people reading it could understand. <laughs> right. And as, as John said, that, that was uh, entirely because Dorothy herself uh, did not want uh, that to become uh, the sort of uh, controlling public narrative. To, to me, Stephen, um, especially in those last three or four years, Dorothy's emotional sustenance for King as he as he comes under more and more uh, public stress and strain, um, is is really um, uh, centrally uh, uh, important in King's life. Mm. Uh, now, as John knows too, uh, they had a fight in Memphis uh, the night of April third, mm. and Dorothy left and flew back to Atlanta on the fourth. And when she lands at Hartsfield, she learns that Doc has been killed. Mm. Um, and so Dorothy had to live 
uh, with that burden, uh, you know, privately for, for decades. Mm. Wow. Wow. Um, uh, I, I do want to talk about um, uh, the role that uh, King plays in America both before and and now i think uh, there's there's uh, something really interesting about a near 40 year stretch between these two books uh, and and who king was to america in the 1980s and who king is to america in in 2024 uh, jonathan i'm going to i'm going to start with you uh, because your your volume is the is the most recent look at king's life uh, but but give me a sense of how much you think he has changed to us over over that time i mean uh, he has been uh, gone a long time now uh, but the people have been writing about him since he left and and i wonder what you make of what Americans feel or know or understand about King today that maybe they didn't 30 or 40 years ago? Well, one thing we've seen happen in the last uh, 25, 30 years since the creation of the national holiday is is uh, we've seen King's message watered down. We've been offered the opportunity and we've seized on the opportunity of embracing the parts of his message that make us most comfortable. So we talk about the dream, and we talk about judging people by the content of their character and not the mm-hmm. color of their skin without mm-hmm. recognizing that in the first half of that same famous speech, the I Have a Dream speech, he talked about things like uh, police brutality and income inequality, and that if he was speaking at the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. Yes. So um, some people who I interviewed, some of King's closest friends, wondered sometimes if the government did it on purpose, if they knew that by honoring King with this national holiday, they would have the opportunity to de-radicalize him, to they defang him. They would strip him. him of, yeah, that's really an interesting idea. I mean, I, I talk all the time about how he's become almost like a Christmas character in 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 popular American narrative that that uh, he he is not – his ideas are not to be – Feared by the status quo or or white America, but but that they can be used to to kind of quell uh, black agitation about about what what's going on in our country. That's right. And Harry Belafonte said, "We don't teach radical heroes in America. We don't teach <laughs> radical history, even though radicalism is, is at the root of American history." Um, and he encouraged uh, us to read the first half of King's "I Have a Dream" speech and and not to let students off the hook, only reading the second half. Yeah, yeah, uh, David. W- what do you see in terms of the change in in who King is to us over over that time? And again, going back to the time that you were writing about him, which is much closer to his death. I wish we had much much more attention paid. Uh, to the history of local level struggles. Now, Montgomery, thankfully, has has really blossomed in in people's understanding of that. Mrs. Joanne Robinson and the other women who really got the boycott started. But when we look at other places, um, you know, Birmingham or Selma, uh, you know, even though those are are very well known names, uh, there's no widespread public understanding of how incredibly courageous Fred Shuttlesworth uh, was in Birmingham, that that without Fred, uh, you know, what what takes place there in 63 would just not have been possible. Um, And and King himself felt very much that way. So did did Miss Baker, um, that that they wished that, that all of this fame that is so highly concentrated on King uh, you know, could could be much more uh, inclusively shared. I have one last uh, one last question, and it may be an unfair question, but I'm going to ask it. Uh, you're two white guys writing about uh, the most famous African American of the 20th century, uh, and and I struggled to to think of. Uh, a king biography of this magnitude that has yet to be written by an African American. And you know, the other the other major biography that we re- referenced before is is Taylor Branch's uh, look at the civil rights movement uh, parting the waters. I wonder what you make of that. Why have we not seen uh, an African American telling 
of this story at, at, at this level. David, I'll start with you. Um, when I started work on, on what became Bearing the Cross in 1979, and this will sound very, very strange to, to most listeners today, uh, I was like the only person doing this. I mean, there was astonishingly little interest in, in unearthing civil rights movement history really until Eyes on the Prize, the, the mm-hmm. famous PBS documentary series in 1986. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jonathan, why, why do you imagine we're not seeing this, this story told from an African-American voice? Well, I would just, first of all, give a shout out because we uh, need to acknowledge that people like David Levering Lewis and uh, yes. Michael Eric Dyson and Tommy Shelby yes. and Brandon Terry have written very well on Dr. King over the years. And in yes. fact, uh, David Levering Lewis did it before anyone else. Um, he also, um, Lawrence Dunbar Reddick wrote the first King biography, and it's a fabulous, uh, really important work. So uh, I, I think that, you know, um, every generation, uh, we, we, will, we need new King biographies and, and uh, we will see <laughs> more coming. And uh, there's right. certainly no... Um, you know, I think uh, it's in the spirit of Dr. King that we should all write about him. And, and if we write about him well and, and do service to the story, then uh, we all add to his to his legacy. Yeah. Yeah. OK, uh, guys. And, and was, Steve, yeah, Stephen, go ahead, Stephen, if I may, may just quickly add, um, I think especially with regard to, to all the personal life challenges uh, uh, King confronted, um, that as time goes by, we need. Uh, women's voices uh, right. uh, discussing King, analyzing King, and and not just um, all of us who are male, uh, irrespective of color. Yeah, yeah, no, great, great point, great, great point. point. Yeah. That was Jonathan Eig and David Garrow, both Pulitzer Prize winners for their biographies of Martin Luther King Jr. That episode aired Tuesday, August 13th. Up next, we're going to hear a discussion about whether there's room in the Democratic Party for both opponents of the Israeli war in Gaza and backers of Israeli interests. We'll be right back with more Created Equal. back with more Created Equal from WDET in Detroit. I'm Stephen Henderson with our weekly recap, and Carrie Jr. the second is here as well. Up next, Carrie, we're going to listen back to a conversation we had late in the week about this tension that exists inside the Democratic Party between uh, people who are really upset about what is happening in the Middle East, the, the war that Israel has been prosecuting in Gaza for nearly a year now that that flared up during the presidential primaries when lots of people went to the polls and voted uncommitted rather than casting a vote in support of President Joe Biden, who was the the nominee back then. It's back in the news a little bit because Biden has stepped aside and Vice President Kamala Harris is now the presumptive nominee. And she says she has a different take on all of that. The question is whether it's different enough to get those uncommitted voters back into the fold and whether you can do that without offending the Israeli interests, the pro-Israeli interests that are also part of the Democratic Party. We'll see. I mean, I think Vice President Harris's stance and international policy will still learn more of over the upcoming weeks and into the Democratic National Convention. But we wanted to ask the question whether or not folks here uh, have heard enough to make their decision on where they stand in this election. Yeah. And so we talked with uh, two people, Abbas Alawiya, who is one of the uncommitted voters and will be an uncommitted delegate, in fact, to the Democratic National Convention next week in Chicago. And we talked with Andy Levin, who is a former member of Congress here, who's now working for the Center for American Progress. He was one of the people in 2022 
who lost his seat in part because of the stance he took on the Middle East and against Israeli aggression. I want to talk, uh, before we get to calls, and we've already got uh, people queuing up to, to be part of this conversation, but I want to talk just a little about uh, the opposition inside the party uh, to, I guess, to the uncommitted uh, voters. Uh, uh, APAC, which is uh, the, the, um, the lobbying arm of, of the pro-Israeli uh, constituency in this country, has been really active this cycle, uh, trying to make sure that uh, Democrats up and down the ticket uh, are sufficiently in favor of Israeli policy. Um, AIPAC has spent $15 million on com- campaign contributions for Democrats this year. There were some key primary races where uh, their support was pivotal. Uh, Cori Bush, who, uh, Abbas, you used to work for, lost her primary in Missouri last week. Uh, AIPAC spent $9 million attacking Bush in ads. Uh, Jamal Bowman, who was another Democratic com- congressperson from New York, lost his primary. APAC spent $14.5 million supporting uh, his, his challenger. Uh, it, it seems to me that the effectiveness of this strategy is part of your problem. In other words, that um, uh, the uncommitted vote got a lot of attention and and uh, got a lot of press, but it had no consequences uh, for Joe Biden. It didn't it didn't cost anybody anything. Uh, meanwhile, uh, APAC is very effective at showing uh, candidates that when they don't support uh, their side of things, that, that you know they can <laughs> they can get rid of you. Um, I, I wonder about that balance and and whether it worries you. That uh, that the Democratic Party um, can't or won't take you seriously enough uh, to change that policy. And in other words, are are you overmatched um, in the in the argument about which constituency inside the party ought to have the loudest loudest voice? Abbas, go ahead. That's a really important um, question that you're asking, Stephen. And again, I will uh, I, I will sort of ground us in what we're up against on the Republican side. When we're talking about Donald Trump, we're talking about someone whose plans would be deeply destructive for our social policy agenda here in this country, but also on issues of Middle East policy. Donald Trump's ideas around Palestinians are let's 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 kill people faster. Uh, let's uh, f- uh, fund the annexation of the West Bank. Let's get his son-in-law million-dollar condos on uh, on Gaza Beach so that uh, already displaced Palestinians can be further displaced. That's the destructive. Um, th- that's a destructive agenda we're dealing with on the other side. Now, it just so happens that the group that you're describing, APAC, has a whole bunch of donors who are actively funding Donald Trump. That is their vision for how our go- how our government's relationship should be with. Uh, with the Israeli government, a lot uh, th- th- that group in particular is a champion for Benjamin Netanyahu. In my mind, Benjamin Netanyahu is not a partner for peace. He is a purveyor of fascism in the same way that Donald Trump is. So I think we need to ask ourselves. And you, you know, you're, you're talking about you know these numbers of how much APAC spent in uh, uh, Cory Bush's race or Jamal Bowman's race. Uh, just you know, to, to make sure we're all on the same page. The, what you know, APAC's influence in those two races made those two races the two most expensive races in the history of our country. This is not normal. This is a subversion of our democracy. And so we have to ask ourselves, why is it that uh, that particular group or other right-wing elements are simultaneously uh, pushing our politics towards Bet- uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's um, uh, you know, uh, murderous policies and at the same time eliminating the people, uh, you know, spending more money than, than we've ever seen, trying to eliminate the, uh, the strongest champions of human rights for everyone. I want a Democratic Party that is the Democratic Party of Andy Levin and Jamal Bowman and, and, and Cory Bush and so many others where it's all of us. It's working class people. It's, uh, it's Arabs and, and Jewish folks and, and black folks all coming together and saying, this is for us. We get to determine what is the best use of our tax dollars. 
I think groups like the ones you've mentioned are trying to subvert our democracy, not strengthen it. And that really worries me. But uh, APAC, and you're right, APAC is is not a, 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 an interest that's aligned with one particular party. It, it supports uh, uh Candidates in in different parties, and of course has donors who are from different parties. But but there is a large part of of the support for APAC that is inside the Democratic Party, and there were these were Democrats in Missouri and New York who voted Cory Bush and Jamal Bowman out. Uh, the money, of course, always matters in these races. Uh, but but I guess what I'm trying to get at is, do you? How does that make you feel as part of the Democratic Party? Or does it make you feel part of the Democratic Party? If you've got this other constituency that not only is opposed to what you believe, but is also as powerful as it is, uh, where do you go? How do you you match that? I believe that in the long term, people power will win. I believe that in the long term, war is not a sustainable strategy, whether be it be it a foreign policy strategy or a campaign strategy. I also believe what we know are the cold hard facts that the majority of Democratic voters and indeed voters in our country support a ceasefire, something that APAC has been working against. The majority of voters in our country support peace and justice. And so when you look at what how APAC is engaging in these races, even though they, you know, they're articulating that this is their number one issue, Israeli policy, the millions of dollars that they're pouring in to spread uh, lies and misinformation about Jamal Bowman, for example, or, or, a, uh, or a Corey Bush or, or anyone else, you look at their ads. They have nothing to do with APAC. They're, it's not like they're going to Democratic voters and saying, here's Corey Bush's record on Palestinian human rights, and here's the other guys, and you know, we think you should vote for the other guy because of, because of Israel. No, no, they're saying they're, – they're just spreading you know, sort of like these, this fear-mongering about um, every other issue except for this issue. And that makes me feel like, well, actually, the people – want peace the people want justice and it's these powerful it's these you know sort of uh, um, you know these uh, the, the the influence of dark money um, in our politics that's breaking our politics I think we need to change that I, I don't understand how I, like it, it still doesn't make sense to me just as a regular everyday person why it's okay or legal for <laughs> millions and millions of dollars to be spent to influence uh, uh, our elections in this way. It feels like subversion of democracy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Andy Levin, I want to bring you back into the conversation here. Uh, you, of course, were uh, a member of Congress and uh, had to deal with uh, these these opposing constituencies from, from an office-holding uh, perspective. I want to compare your experience to – the experience of another Michigan Democrat, Rashida Tlaib, uh, who, who still is in Congress, of course, uh, but but she was censored uh, by Congress for her comments about what was happening in Gaza uh, last year. And what I remember, the the one of the strongest uh, uh, forces I remember uh, uh, making that happen was, of course. Uh, the Republican caucus, which uh, was has control of of the House, um, and uh, was was behind making sure that she was censured for this. At the same time, you had Democrats uh, inside the caucus also supporting this, though, and and saying that uh, you know what she said was was inappropriate. And and I I want to make it really clear. That uh, you know, Rashida has said over and over again that uh, her criticism is always of the Israeli government and what uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is doing. It is not uh, of, of 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 Israel or its right to exist. Uh, but that didn't matter. Uh, you know, uh, they they had the votes to to censure her. Give us a sense, uh, Andy, of what that's like to be part of. Uh, Congress and have these this push and pull tension of these two constituencies and how you work it out. I mean, in your case, it, it ended in a primary loss, uh, like Cory Bush or or Jamal Bowman. But uh, but even while you're in office, how do you manage all this? And then again, does it make you feel as though you have a place in the Democratic Party? 
Yeah, Stephen, the thing I would emphasize is that this is a complete distortion of the Democratic Party. So, for example, 22 people, as I recall, 22 Democrats voted to to send to send Shah Rashid to leave. Mm-hmm. That means that like 80 to 90 percent of them didn't. Right. Yes. <laughs> so come on. I mean, the vast, vast majority of Democrats in the House refused to to, to censure her for stating her beliefs passionately. And I just want to emphasize, you know, APAC is not a Democratic group, capital D or maybe small d, um, (laughs) but it's not a Democratic Party constituency. And it's just crucial to understand that most of the money they are spending in of the dark money they are spending to defeat progressive Democrats Mm -hmm. is coming from Republican mega donors, billionaires who, as a boss said earlier, support Donald Trump. This this is a big problem for the Democratic Party leadership because, Stephen, the fossil fuel industry isn't dumb. The tobacco industry isn't dumb. Mm-hmm. The big pharma isn't dumb. These generally Republican interest groups could say, oh, gee, thank you, APAC. This is a great model. We won't just pick the Republican nominees in the you know Republican primaries. We'll pick the Democrats, too. And if the Democratic Party allows, if really this is a, like a, a broad political science theory, just think about it. Think, take yourself back if you took a political science class in college. <laughs> if your poli sci professor said to you, well, what, what, is there a problem if m- m- most of the spending in the primary of one party comes from the other party? You'd say, well, each yeah. party should pick its own candidate. Yeah. So this is, a, this is a distortion of democracy. And as, as Abbas also pointed out, it's, they are not winning over Democrats on this issue. They're not talking about Israel and Palestine at all in this millions of dollars of avalanches of advertisements on television and radio and social media. They're not, they're not being honest at all about what their interest is. So, and so the, so the Andy, majority of Democrats, no, Stephen, the vast majority of Democrats are with us on this issue. They want justice for Jews and Muslims and Christians, everybody living on the land in, you know, Israel and Palestine. And I feel like we will, you know, we have to find a way to move forward on this. Donald Trump is a disaster for the Palestinian people and for anybody who's queer or homeless or has, you know, disabilities or many other people who you know, are great Americans, you know, citizens and, and people living here who, who need their rights and people abroad. So we have to defeat Donald Trump. And we're just saying we really want to help uh, Vice President Harris, who's in a very difficult position because yeah. she's not the president. Right. And, and President she does Biden not set the policy. Now. policy. That's so right. what is she supposed to do? But we do hope that she can find a way to continue really going beyond that amazing way she punched through in in her in 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 the anniversary of bloody sunday speech where she clearly showed that she hears the the and she sympathizes with the the horror that people feel over what's happening in gaza that was abbas alawiya and former congressman andy levin talking about the tension within the Democratic Party between those who are angry about the Israeli war in Gaza and those who are supporting Israeli interests. That episode aired on Wednesday, August 14th. So that's a wrap on the week, Kerry. I really enjoyed our conversation we had about the, the split in the Democratic Party, par, par, uh, primarily, which is kind of un- unlikely sometimes. I don't. The live shows are always kind of... Um, in the weeds of the news of the area. I always like to find like the, the split between within the unity, I guess I should say. And yeah. so I think this one was really kind of, there was some real urgency way. to that, to that conversation. Yeah. And I thought that went really well. We got great calls yeah. during that conversation as well. I, I, I really enjoyed the oh. conversation with David Garrow and Jonathan Eig, the two mm-hmm. Martin Luther King biographers. I just think that's fascinating mm-hmm. to think about the way that you do that kind of work 40 years, nearly 40 years apart yeah. from each other. Uh, all of these works help us understand this I- immense civil rights icon a lot better than uh, we would if, they, if we didn't have those volumes. 
That's it for Created Equal. You can listen to recent episodes at WDET.org and make sure to subscribe to our podcast where you can leave us a rating or a review. Created Equal is produced by Carrie Jr. II and David Lines. The audio editing is by Connor Anderson and the music is by Sam Bobian. Created Equal is a production of WDET, a listener-supported service of Wayne State University.